everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, managing partner at Oxbow, and I'm glad to have this fellow back with us, Mike Green. And the one of the things I like about Mike, number one, he manages money, but he's always managed money. And I've <laughs> always said this, uh, Mike, you get more out of people that manage money than people that just write about it. And so we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. He's chief strategist, portfolio manager at Simplify. And I could go through a lot of history for you, Mike, but uh, you've done some great things and managed some good money in your life. Oh, I appreciate that. I've been very, very fortunate. Let me uh, start off and I, uh, a little bit here. Let, and just in general, talk about where we are uh, in the cycle. And I think you know this as well as anybody, but there's these there's these two opposing views out there. We're going to have a recession, not going to have one. It seems to be fading away now that we're not going to have one. But how do, how do you see things? Well, listen, I got to be honest with you. I mean, I sent you a couple of charts. One of the things that I think is frustrating for many of us is if we look at what happened last year and kind of the 22 to 23 time period, we saw a lot of indications that are completely consistent with a recession. We saw an increase in unemployment, particularly for the lower skilled workers as they began to face competition coming in from immigration. We began to see a significant deterioration in states like California. I'll highlight some of the dynamics around that. Um, and, and I would argue that most interestingly is we actually saw a dramatic deterioration in things like real personal income, but that in large camouflaged and covered by the retained savings and earnings that had actually been generated during the time period. And so while a lot of the data would suggest that we actually did have a recession, it just didn't show up in the actual spending data. And, you know, you can you can argue about that all you want. And I certainly am frustrated with the the day. But, um, you know, we've had a, just a really interesting cycle where we have been in the PMI, for example, the manufacturing indices have been in contraction for basically the longest they've ever done in history. Right. And in prior cycles, when we've gone through this, we've seen this contraction. Those of us who tried to get ahead of it were just wrong. And so now the question becomes, as you point out, like the narrative has shifted and it said we're facing re-acceleration. I got to tell you, like we'll talk through, we'll walk through some of the slides, but the thing that worries me most is, is that we are very, very close to this refinancing wall on a lot of these levered companies that, you know, we're seeing the signs that's already starting to break down. We saw the losses from uh, New York City Bank Corp yesterday in terms of real estate exposure. You've seen Evergrande. The uh, Chinese real estate developer turned into an absolute bagel. Like this is this is how a credit cycle develops, right? It moves from orderly and sustainable and everybody working together to basically everybody scrambling to try to get theirs. So I, it, it, it feels like the soft landing is further away than people think, or harder to achieve than people think. And, you know, Mike, uh, I'm in contact with, you know, I'm involved in a community bank, but I'm also involved with other people that are in community banks. And for the first time in a long time, a lot of community banks are they're going to make they're making no money or they're starting to lose money because just yeah. reds are down so far that you know their expenses, et cetera, that they can't make any money. Well, this is this is one of the characteristics we have in this economy, right? We very much have a feast famine type environment. If your bank, your community bank, is named J.P. Morgan, they're paying nothing on deposits. Because people are seeking the safety, particularly corporations in the aftermath of events like Silicon Valley Bank, they just have to have to be Morgan because they know it's safe, right? That's created an incredible cost advantages for companies like JP Morgan. On the flip side of that, you've had the, the BTFP program that was introduced in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank that effectively raised the cost of finance in line with U.S. Treasuries for all intents and purposes. And so you have banks that are funding themselves at 5%. You have banks that are funding themselves at zero. And well, that's and for, you know, uh, having huge implications. Yeah, for you individuals out there on BTFP, it basically was a setup, so it was a guaranteed return. <laughs> if you're a community bank and you didn't do it, you were crazy because there's a lock-in guaranteed return. Uh, and it, it does exactly what you're talking about. But it was it, it was interesting. They popped that right back out, and and it and it it was interesting about New York Community Bank. They bought the assets of somebody had already. Silicon so Valley Bank, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know. Anyway, uh, and so you, do you think you know? Listening to Powell, Chairman Powell, yesterday on the in the Fed, um, what did that sound like to you? Well, look, the the most important. Um, 
thing that I'm following with Powell is it feels very much like he himself is deeply uncertain, basically trying to work towards an objective rather than um, offering a fundamental assessment or a rational approach, almost a formulaic approach. If we go back to December, you know, his direct quote was, um, we would have to cut before inflation falls below 2%, because otherwise we're looking at inflation falling below target. That would be late in the process. Yesterday, we heard him explicitly say, we want to see inflation fall below 2%. So we're watching um, a Fed that I would argue is responding to what's labeled financial conditions, basically how tight are credit spreads, what's the level of the market at, and presuming that that's actually carrying a fundamental signal around the behavior and performance of the economy. And I think it as you point out, like we're actually seeing some pretty severe crap begin to emerge, particularly in smaller companies. Russell 2000 down year to date, direct comparison relative to you know the NASDAQ, which has been very strongly performing and up. A pattern we've seen repeatedly over the past several years. And when we talk about the Russell 2000, I just want to remind people that these are small companies in the context of the public markets, but you're your mid off to be in the Russell 2000, I think it's about $450 million worth of market cap right now. If you know somebody who owns a $450 million company, they're not a small businessman in your local community. That's a giant corporation employing thousands and thousands of people. Um, and those areas of the markets are really struggling. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I'm not, I think this is the first time it's probably happened, at least that I've noticed it happening last year. Every month except one, we had a revision on the jobs. So we yeah. didn't really see what we had. And you've got two or three really good slides about how the reports are inaccurate and where actually the birth death model. You might talk about that a bit. Absolutely. Do you do you want to pull this up or you want me to share my screen and we'll, pull those up? We'll pull it in. We'll pull it in for you. Okay. All right. So the first chart is actually looking. So remember when we talk about job reports, there's two separate sources of jobs. There's jobs that come from the private sector and there's jobs that come from the public sector. First, We've actually seen an explosion of the share of jobs that are coming from the public sector, effectively government hiring, right? That's an easy way from a political framework to juice the unemployment characteristics or job numbers. Um, this is certainly not unique to this administration as much as we'd like to lay it at the feet of this administration. I know a lot of people are very frustrated. Um, but Tip O'Neill, for example, back in the 1980s was extraordinarily well known for highlighting that all jobs are local. And guess what? He gets to hand them out. Um, so, you know, when you were when, when there was a blizzard in Boston, it would lead to an explosion of payrolls because he would actually be able to hire people to go shovel. Right. So if you look at the chart that I labeled unlikely that job reports are accurate, what I'm looking at here is just the private sector and the private sector has an additional wrinkle that's laid onto it. This was created in 2000 by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in an attempt to reduce the frequency and need for revisions to data. Now, that's the great irony, of course, as you're pointing out, we've now seen continuous revisions to the downside. And the reason why that's happening is, is that the birth death model that is used to actually provide that modification has become horribly skewed. And um, Mike, uh, could you just give a one quick sentence on what that is for yes that's exactly where I, that's that's where i was going to go so so the birth death model is an attempt by the bls to model the business that are not captured in survey data but radically are coming into existence and hiring new employees right and this makes perfect sense right we all know that if the corner store opens up the bls doesn't get a notification that says hey you should start calling these people and ask them how many people they're hiring right so there's an attempt to model the frequency of that the problem is, is that the data sets that they use to model that frequency rely on a couple of individual components. One is what's called um, the, the uh, employee identification number applications. And so when you found a business or you start reporting taxes from an LLC type framework or a corporate framework, you need to have an employee identification number similar to a social security number that you fill out on your tax forms. Um, the process of applying for that EIN has actually become dramatically easier, which it facilitates an increase, right? So relative to the historical framework in which you would have to write a letter and actually send in a printed form and go through this whole process, now it's a simple application and you receive a response in 15 minutes. The second thing that's happened is, is that we've actually dramatically expanded the need to use EINs. And in particular, things like gig economy workers or um, very small businesses that might never have considered doing this before 
are suddenly incentivized to do that in particular because there was another rule change. And this is obviously the sort of fun stuff that you dig into and discover as you try to understand how these systems are working. The need to file an EIN um, is tied to your need to receive a 1099 form. The 1099 form is the tax form that's paid from business to business effectively. Things like Venmo used to allow you to have up to $20,000 of, of expenses that you could pay somebody, or as a small business, you were eligible for up to $20,000 in receipts without having to file for business taxes. That changed to $600 in 2020, right? Now, the difference between 2020 at, at, at $20,000 and 2021 at six. dollars at, at $600 has led to an explosion in EIN applications, which the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is interpreting as a surge in entrepreneurship in the United States and an incredible growth of new businesses, many of which are in things like retail, which basically means that you are a DoorDash deliverer, or transportation and logistics, which means you drive people from place to place with Uber. And in a lot of situations, actually, ironically, those end up falling into the category of what's called high propensity to higher jobs. And so it's just messed up the entire system. So could you say, uh, would you say that in, in simplest form, those are people that were working but are still working, but, but they didn't know it? <laughs> or they yeah, didn't pick I, it up like the, that? Correct. That's exactly or, or more accurately, they are small businesses that we didn't label right. small businesses before. Right. right. And so when you actually system with that and then assume that those businesses are going to hire people, you end up with statistics that suggest we've seen a surge of entrepreneurship and an explosive growth in small business hiring that just doesn't match up. And then there's one last factor that I think is really important for people to understand, which is historically the response rates to business surveys were in the 70 to 90 percent range, right? So businesses, when surveyed by the government, were more than eager to respond and say, here's how many employees I have, here are my hiring plans, et cetera. In many situations, the response rates to those surveys have fallen into the 30s, the low 30%. So the JOLT survey, the Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey, for example, used to have regular response rates in the mid 70s. Today, it's looking at response rates that are in the low 30s. And unfortunately, if you don't get a response to a survey, you have to make a decision about how you're going to treat it. And so the BLS decided to treat non-responses as if they behaved like everybody else. So you fail to respond, and guess what? You're presumed to be hiring like those who did. You know, and I've read where uh, people don't respond because they read everything on social media already, and they they <laughs> they see other uh, attitudes or what goes on, and so they well, why would I respond? I already know what's happening. <laughs> well, I, I would also just argue, like, in the immediate aftermath of COVID, right? I mean, what's the most frightening call you can get? I'm here from the government to ask you a few questions. Yeah. Right. And so, like, that's that's turned into a very hostile relationship for a sizable fraction of the population. Disproportionately, I would argue, actually, that segment of the population tends to be the small or medium sized entrepreneurs who are like, you know what? I don't want to talk to you. So let me ask you this. I'll switch switch uh, topics here and talk a little bit about inflation because you've got some you have some great ideas and slides about that. Uh, that uh, relative to commodities and various things, but how do you see that? Yeah. Well, look, I think that there's a couple of things that that help people orient to the world that we live in that is different than the world we grew up in. And so I like to tell people the story of the 20th century is actually one that is truly unique, really the period from 1870 to about 2000. is such an extraordinary period in human history in which the global population, particularly those working age population, grew from about a billion people to about five and a half over, give or take, 120 years. Right? That type of growth means that an extraordinary increase in demand has to be accommodated. And the inflationary characteristics of the 20th century are retied to that underlying characteristic, that incredible growth in mouths to feed, that growth in need for housing, that incredible growth period. Um, the 21st century doesn't look anything like that. It's radically, radically different. If I look at the 21st century, the odds are pretty high that we're in with about five and a half billion people in the global labor force. And we're going to leave with about five and a half billion people in the global labor force if I look at current population trends. And ironically, what that means is, is that we don't have that same outward shift in aggregate demand that characterized the 20th century. 
And so the chart I'm going to show is actually one that links popular growth to the frequency of the use of the word commodity in textbooks or in, in books of all types, right? And this is one of the wonderful things we can do today with digitized data. And what you actually discover is, is that as you would expect, when shortages emerge in the face of an incredible increase in aggregate demand, people start writing about it and they start coming up with solutions to it. And now, of course, we're on the other side of that equation. And while I do think that we're probably underinvested, in, particularly domestically, we're looking at a situation where I just can't create the scenario in which I'm like, oh my gosh, there's going to be this incredible increase in demand for commodities that's going to put us constantly behind the curve in the way that we were in the 1970s. And that's the story that people forget about the 1970s. The true story of the 1970s is that we had the highest growth rates in population that we've ever seen basically in human history. That meant that every single year not expand capacity to an extraordinary degree, you fell behind the aggregate demand curve. That's really what the story of the inflation in the 1970s was. And we just don't have that today. Well, you have a you have a great chart on the dis disruption and growth, and you go back to these key yeah. drivers. You know, that's really interesting. Really, uh, b between labor force and inflation. Yeah, I I think that's really important for people to understand. I mean, inflation can be caused by one one of it can be caused by a constant increase in aggregate demand that supply struggles to match. So the only way that you can solve that problem is by raising prices and making resources less available to people. Um, the same thing happens if there's disruption. War is the classic example, right? But a COVID type dynamic where we do something truly unprecedented and simply turn the light switch of the world off effectively, right? I mean, we literally flip the world light switch off and then we flip on, right? And that created this incredible disruption that was attempted to be papered over by just providing people with money and income to buy stuff. But the supply disruptions in terms of turning the system back on, starting the flow of goods back again, et cetera, created conditions under which that increase in income or that income was capable of basically finding supply. People who lived through COVID remember the shortages of toilet paper that emerged at the very beginning of COVID, right? That felt like this incredibly scary type dynamic that results itself relatively quickly, right? I mean, it, it, like, do you remember, like it, it's hard to actually put yourself back in that, but remember that. The well, exact same people, thing. People went and bought, uh, they bought uh, three or four times what they normally would use. 100%. And so that's exactly what we saw across the vast majority of other stuff. It just, it happened in a slightly slower fashion, not as dramatically. And because it wasn't directly tied to the pandemic, corporations were able to get away with price increases. Right. I mean, the number of people who go to a restaurant or to a store were like, oh, my God, can you believe these prices? And the business owner would look at me like, yeah, what am I supposed to do? Costs are up. Right. You know, inflation. Right. That creates conditions under which people suspend their you know, skepticism effectively and their purchasing capacity to, to comparison shop. But that's reemerging itself. And that's really, I think, what we're seeing in the downward pressure, the disinflationary pressures that we're seeing. If you're not scared there's going to be no toilet paper tomorrow and toilet paper prices are up 20 percent you may actually just say you know what i've got some in the closet i'm just going to wait for it to go on sale and i think we're seeing that behavior increasingly occur across our society and corporations are being forced to respond to that with price decreases on in many a lot situations. of products a lot of, a lot products, of products we've yeah. seen it across yeah. eggs and right. milk and right you're seeing you know the further back the supply chain you go i would actually argue the more we've seen this price response, um, you know, for those who are paying close attention to things like this, gasoline prices are at the same level they were in 2004, for example, right? It's been 20 years, basically, and we've seen no increase in gasoline prices, even though that feels like a category that should be exploding, right? Egg prices, grain prices, wheat prices, copper prices, they're all unchanged really over the past 20 years. And I know that's very hard for people who are watching their cereal box prices go up dramatically, but remember, cereal is about two and a half cents worth of corn, about six cents worth of sugar, and about six dollars worth of marketing and packaging, right? So you know it's a it, it's it, you're not actually seeing inflationary consequ consequences there. I'd argue you're seeing largely market power consequences. So let me switch gears again and uh, look at you know we have this thing going on with interest rates where obviously you nope. haven't broken yet, and so and I it, I think you were correct when you said everybody was wishing and hoping. <laughs> 
I can hang on long enough to where yep. everything will be okay. But so how do you see that? And, you know, I know in, in regard to just a normal borrowing and then, you know, high yield, the whole, the spread, the whole thing, how do you see all that? Well, I mean, this is where it gets really interesting because the U.S. economy is very different than places like Europe or Canada, in which there's a high degree of exposure to variable more to variable interest rates. Even within the United States, you know, if you go back to before the global financial crisis, it was very common, particularly for small businesses um, and even for larger businesses, to rely on things like short-term financing. You, you know, for those who lived through the global financial crisis, you remember things like auction rate securities which were ways of accessing short-term financing characteristics. We took most of that out of our economy. And in the United States, it appears that somewhere around 90% of the debt is fixed rate and form termed out from anywhere from three to, in many situations, 30 years in things like mortgages. And that's made us remarkably insensitive to the increase in interest rates. The problem is that insensitivity then breeds complacency. Right. And so what I would argue has happened is, is that Jerome Powell rapidly hiked interest rates and we haven't seen anything break yet. But now we're actually approaching the point where things may begin to break in a pretty severe way. We're seeing it in commercial real estate. We're beginning to see it in multifamily real estate. We've seen it in many small businesses that rely on things like equipment loans or working capital loans or households that rely on credit cards to obtain access to credit. Those are all areas where we're seeing the impact of this. We're starting to see significantly rising delinquency rates. We're seeing inability to refinance debts. Where it's next going to show up, I would argue, is in the high yield space. And there we have an extraordinary maturity wall, larger than we've ever seen before and shorter in its tenor than we've ever seen before that is rapidly approaching. And we really don't have past 2024 for that. So if interest rates remain at these levels, what many of your listeners will have heard the phrase zombie companies, companies that don't meet their current interest rate or have inability to refinance their current debt levels without tapping capital markets. Those companies are deeply, deeply distressed at this point. When your graph uh, basically shows that over the next three or four years, you get this massive move in, in, in refinance. It looks absolutely. like to me, at least. Uh, no, that's that's absolutely correct. And what we what we have seen, ironically, is because corporations can't afford these higher interest rates, they failed to refinance. And perversely, when you fail to refinance, that means that there is a shortage of new issue paper. And if there is a shortage of new issue paper, that means the people in the industry that have to put funds to work are forced to buy things at tighter and tighter cut. Uh, credit spreads. And this is exactly what we've seen. We've seen credit spreads move in the high yield space within the top 15th percentile, basically in the history of the data sets, even as we're watching significant credit quality deterioration and the need for this massive refinancing wall that is going to completely flip that equation. Well, and one of the things we talked about earlier was the fact that I think most people probably don't realize this, but you know, a lot of, particularly a lot of individuals that, you know, they're buying, they're buying high yield and they don't, I don't think they really understand that when that credit spread is real tight like that, they don't, you know, that all, to me, at least that increases the risk uh, eventually of what you're talking about when you get ready to start rolling this stuff over. I think that's very true. I also would, would just highlight that I think a lot of people, when you look at high yield, and I think this is broadly true, you know, we tend to focus on the interest rate or the coupon that we're receiving. And so we'll say, you know, the effective interest rate or the yield to worse, yield to maturity in high yield is somewhere in the 8% range, which actually feels historically high to us and looks relatively attractive. But what that's composed of today is a 5.5% risk-free rate and about 350 basis points worth of credit spread. If I go back you know, three years ago or four years ago, you were looking at 0% interest rates or maybe 1% interest rates at term on the risk-free and the same 350 or even 400 basis points of credit spread to reward you for taking the credit risk. Now, the problem that emerges is that those corporations couldn't care less about that spread characteristic. They care about the all-in costs of financing themselves. And those are about to jump. The weight average coupon in the high yield space right now is about five and a quarter percent, I want to say, maybe five and a half percent. Over the next year, barring a dramatic cut in interest rates, you're going to see that jump by 60 to 70 percent and many of these corporations just can't afford that higher level of interest expense. 
So you're thinking uh, eight, nine. I think that eight and nine hole that they currently anticipate being able to refinance at. The problem is, is that when you move to that refinancing, you actually then suddenly create this flood of issuance that has currently stayed out of the market. So supply is going to increase. Demand actually paradoxically will start to fall if credit spreads begin to rise in response to this increase in supply. And therefore, you actually set up conditions. My, my math suggests that we really should be looking more like 12 to 13 percent. And that's going to be like, if that happens, we're going to have a credit cycle, the likes of which we really haven't seen since the global financial crisis or even earlier to be quite transparent. And, you know, Mike, as a new investor, uh, I just have a question. As a new investor, you've never bought bonds before. And so you say, OK, I'm going to put a lot of my money in the long bond. And yet you're making the point that, OK, this is the perfect time in my life. The rates are never going to change. I'm OK for the next 10 or 15 years. And that seems like that's a tough bet. Well, I think it depends on which long bond you're referring to, right? And so there's a, a tremendous amount of debate around this. First, remember that the long bond has actually rallied sharply from the level it was at last year. And this is actually, you know, some of the components. Oh, shoot. Um, this is some of the components that, uh, you know, we, we were looking at and ultimately saying, um, is inflation going to be out of control? Is the U.S. government going to be able to fund itself? And those continue to be reasonable debates, but the yield itself, like 10-year right now, is about 384 today, right? That was at five and change, basically hit 5% um, earlier this year. That creates conditions under which people look at it now and they're like, well, maybe I want to start to for yield. Again, this is what's part of pushing down the spreads. And I would just encourage people to remember that they will pay you back. It's just a question of are they going to pay you back with inflation adjusted yield? And that's the uncertainty. It's part of the reason though why I emphasize like in the current construction, I'm less concerned about inflation. I'm much more concerned about credit dynamics. I'm going to uh, shift to the stock market because uh, you do obviously a lot of investing in this area. A lot of the products you have at Simplify have some, some, uh, some, some uh, idea about this as well. But I guess my question to you is, I think everybody has the same question, and that is, when do you, when will the, the passive, and I'm speaking about the indexing and the exchange-traded fund type looks, when will that concentration slow down or flatten out or go down? Uh, there has to be some point you would think uh, that we make a shift on that. I can miss you. Well, yeah, no, uh, there we go. I was more garbled on my side too. So could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. You can't uh, what I was saying is I, I think everybody has watched this big passive move oh, yeah. into indexes, exchange traded funds, the whole thing. And everybody has just sort of bought into it. And we, I guess, are a little bit different in the idea that we think eventually if everybody is doing the same thing, it eventually doesn't work if everybody does the same exact thing. And so I'm curious to what you think about, is there a spot where uh, that slows down or we don't have as much indexing and that sort of thing? Well, I'm not sure that I would say that it slows down. We're not going to have as much indexing because I think that that is, um, I think that's a very tough ask in this environment. Um, the 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 challenge is is exactly as you said nothing is good if everybody does it at the same time or together right and it's you know you, you think about the dynamics of um being on a ship if everybody runs over to see a whale on one side of the ship the ship's going to capsize because the weight distribution has changed radically that can largely be thought of as the same we're experiencing in markets where if i go back 20 or 30 years ago the proportion of the market that was invested passively, effectively blindly buying everything in proportion to its market capitalization was really only about one to 2% of the total market. You know, when my career started, it was literally 1%. The growth of Vanguard and entities like Vanguard had been significant, but was still very small. Today, those numbers are north of 40% of all assets in the market are managed in that way. And you know, anything done in an unthinking manner, I would argue, is fairly catastrophic, right? You and I both know Chris Cole. He described it as, you know, repetitive behaviors can be really good. I wake up, I brush my teeth every day. But if I wake up and I call the same girl over and over and over again, despite her not returning my phone calls, that's stalking. 
Um, we effectively rely on markets today to try to accomplish something they're not designed to do. Markets are not designed to deliver retirements. Markets are not designed to deliver a targeted return level. Markets are designed to facilitate the allocation of capital. And if we stop thinking about how we allocate that capital, or we allow a strategy that does not think and simply relies on everyone else to do the thinking, then we actually create conditions under which they're going to fail. We've seen this happen in systematic strategies like inverse volatility ETF, so the VIX, you're familiar with the dynamics of what happened with XIV, for example, which went to zero from two and a half billion overnight. Um, unfortunately, the statistics and the data actually look very similar for overall markets. And the real challenge is as more and more people move into this unthinking, just put my money to, you know, um, there's that meme, you know, just take my money, right? You know, just take my money. Um, it, it, you know, it, it is, as more and more people move into that, we need to recognize at some point somebody says, hey, give me my money back. And when that give me my money back, you know, begins to outweigh the here, take my money, then the market behavior can change in very unpredictable and dramatic ways. And unfortunately, with the aging of the baby boomers and the continued growth of passive, I think we're getting closer and closer to that point. I also provided you with a chart that I they really, for the first time, we're actually starting to see some of these Vanguard flows, some of these Vanguard funds look starting to move into distribution. This is new. This is not something we've seen on a sustained basis before. And candidly, it's one of the things that has me quite worried about the outlook for markets in the next couple of years. Well, and, and on that respect, because uh, if, if in fact you have another slide about the boomer retirements, and if that becomes outflows, for example, that and the boomers have more money than everybody else, you would yep. think that that would overshadow even the smaller people in 401ks and that sort of thing. Well, that's it's actually part of that chart is showing you. It's actually highlighting that with these funds, which tend to be emphasized within the 401ks, we're actually now seeing outflows. And so we are at that point where things like 401k plans and IRAs, which you know, we tend to think of as having been around forever, but they really are very new creations in the world of finance. IRAs were created in 1971. 401ks were created in 1978. They didn't really exist as a force in the market in the early 1980s. or about $150 billion between the two of them. Today, they're $25 trillion. The United States has the world's largest sovereign wealth fund or giant retirement scheme that increasingly is behaving as if it's a single fund because it's all allocated to total market indices or the S&P 500. And so the movement and behavior of those assets can actually become very, very different as people start to take withdrawals. And the last thing I would just highlight for people is remember contributions are always a function of income, right? I can only save what I earn. Withdrawals are a function of asset levels. So when asset levels rise much more rapidly than income levels, the risk that the withdrawals begin to exceed the contributions, it almost becomes a fait accompli. And you know, Mike, uh, when you when you look at this, it's it's interesting because, and I know you know this, managing money, but like for us, and I know a lot of money managers, we have a, a, a our clientele are usually sold a business or something. You know, they're yep. they're going to have to live off of that, and so we always have at least a four percent bogey. We have to clear just because they're spending it, you know, yep. now we start to see sometimes they take more than that. And that would tie into what you're talking about here, where they're taking out, but they're not going to a new investment, right? They're spending it. Well, I, ironically, there's a couple of interesting things, right? So one is they're spending it. And I think that is actually really critical. The second is um, one of the really nice things that's happened. You talk about that 4% bogey, that 4% bogey is now achievable in many ways through high quality bonds. That wasn't the case two years ago. Right. And so that creates risk that people begin to say, you know what, I just don't want to take the risk of equities. The the other dynamic, though, that um, I think you hit on that's actually really, really important is this idea of contributions tend to be earlier in your life. They tend to be episodic. Once you move out, once you've actually sold that business and you start living off of that, your contributions are far less frequent and less you know, common relative to the withdrawals. And then the last thing that's actually happening, this is a really critical one, right? So remember, when people move away from hiring discretionary managers who run a fund that is you know, capable of holding cash, capable of saying, I think valuations are too high, I don't want to be involved, 
that effectively becomes a soft contribution. It's almost like a recommendation. You know, here's some money. Maybe you should buy some stuff, right? When you hand that to an index fund, an index fund does not react that way at all. An index fund actually operates off of the world's simplest algorithm. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. At what price? Whatever price I can get, right? And so when that comes in in the form of buying, well, whatever price I can get, boy, that's a really effective negotiation technique, right? Try walking into a local, like, I really want to negotiate about this price. Well, what price for? Well, whatever price I can get, right? That doesn't work well. Likewise, if you try to sell, well, whatever price I can get, it's not going to work, in a, particularly in a disorderly situation. We have very few examples where passive vehicles have actually been net sellers because of the share gain, the, the, the growth of that segment of the market. Some of those I would highlight are things like the COVID experience where, you know, I, I share this all the time with people. In the aftermath of the COVID events, Vanguard released a self-congratulatory message, which is less than 1% of our clients tried to sell. And my reaction to that is, oh my God, what if it had been two <laughs> you know, like you just sit there like going, wait a second, like is nobody actually thinking about how to get out of this very, very crowded theater? And the answer is no. Well, and I know I've heard you speak about this before, but I certainly agree with it because we manage some foundations as well. And it was really hard for, you know, they had the payout minimum. And it was interesting uh, if you talk to them about buying the the 5% or 5.5% treasury they were like, well, no, I have to keep my alternatives and this, that, and the other. And we're, and we're always like, well, your bogey's here. I mean, you already hit it. Yeah. So why don't you do yeah. more of that? And and uh, I know you've you've spoken about talking to uh, different foundations or pension plans where yeah. they just couldn't see the light on it. Well, I, I would I would maybe even go a step further, right? I mean, we we tend we've gotten to the point where the data that is available to us, I would argue, is misleading us, right? So we think that equity markets are supposed to return X, right? They do eight percent a year. That's what Vanguard or that's what the history books tell us, right? Well, unfortunately, like we actually don't know what they do in the future. You you put on everything you put out a disclaimer that says past performance is no guarantee of future, you know, results, right? That actually is supposed to mean something. We don't really know. We've got 100,000 years as a you know anatomically modern species. We've got roughly 10,000 years of written history. And we've got, congratulations, about 75 to 100 years of decent financial market data. The simple reality is we have no idea what equities are supposed to return. And so when we adopt models that presume that it's effectively certain what they're going to return, and that's really what you have when you talk about those rigid models, you look at a gift like a five plus percent treasury and you say, yeah, but I expect equities to make eight, right? Or I expect, you know, these things that don't have those same guarantees to do it. And it becomes very hard to make those allocations. I, I would suggest that a big chunk of what we saw last year in terms of the sell-off in bonds and the increase in rates to those levels was a function of people not being able to sit down and say, well, wait a second, exactly as you're saying, we're meeting our objective with no risk. Why wouldn't we take that? And that discussion requires multiple meetings. We're, we're, we're meeting our objective with no risk. Why don't we take it? Why don't we take it? Why don't we take it? And then all of a sudden, like, okay, okay let's take it. And guess what? The process of them deciding to take it causes yields to start to fall. Yeah. Right. And so I really think that's what happened last year. Yeah, to a high degree. And the other thing is that is that we when we tell this to a lot of financial planning people, because we're like, hey, nope. how can you how can you lay out a linear 15 or 20 year look for someone? that is scale, you know, and it's all linear, everything's just, you know, buttoned up tight when that's probably won't be the case at all because none of us really know what's going to happen. So you have to start with the premise that, hey, I've got to do some protection first. The drawdown is what I can't take. And, but yeah. I'm not certain everybody looks at it that way. Do you think? I, I don't think they do. And I actually would go a step further and, and just highlight for people that remember that, um, you know, when we talk about price to value something, what really matters is the pattern of flows associated with them. And so just if you imagine what an equity is, an equity is um, a never ending, expanding cone of possibilities, right? It basically is going off like this, right? And there's a scenario in which it's worthless. And there's a scenario in which you get to become Elon Musk, right? Um, a bond looks like an American football, right? It has a certainty at the point to which you buy it. And then the path of interest rates tells you the price over time but maturity is always a fixed level, right? And people undervalue that certainty, I would argue today. 
they undervalue that certainty of here's how much money I'm going to have at that point. So building things like bond ladders, et cetera, is cast art in a lot of ways where people are thinking about, here's the cash flows that I need to live my life. Instead, we kind of have people presuming that they'll be able to sell stuff at reasonable prices off into the future and overweighting the um, growth potential of those equities. Well, that's one of the reasons we use individual bonds of all kinds, because we need to find mature, defined maturities. Uh, we can't, you know, we, we can't depend on a fund that we have no idea where they're going one way or the other. But uh, let me ask you this. I'll wind up with this because so, we've shown during this period ways to get in touch with Simplify and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah. what would you say, you know, to the individual investor out there uh, that really needs to be thinking about some things? What, what would you be saying to an individual investor today? Well, I, I actually think this is an interesting period. I mean, the, the recent rally in rates has damaged this statement to a certain extent, but you've, you've heard me talk about this, that I really do think that people are ignoring the value of that, that certainty that's being created, right? We're operating largely in an environment of fear in which we're terrified of runaway inflation. We're scared of that fixed income characteristic. I, I want to be clear, I don't have a crystal ball. I've shared some charts to share, share my perspective on these things. And I think in general, people are far too worried. It's a natural consequence as you get older that you're going to be deprived of access to stuff, right? Am I going to be able to retain my home? Am I going to be able to go to the store and buy stuff, et cetera? Um, it would be an unusual circumstance, very unusual circumstance for that not to be the truth or the, the, the case. And so I, I, I just want to highlight to people that there's a really interesting opportunity in fixed income. I also think that we've opened up the door to non-equity alternatives. We all offer products like a managed futures account that is trend following in its construction. Those tend to do very well if there are inflationary periods. I highlight that areas like credit actually offer a reasonably attractive, fairly attractive in absolute terms, absolute return, but you got to manage against that credit exposure. And so what Simplify is really known for is bringing hedge fund like strategies into ETFs so that they can be done in a tax efficient manner and they can be presented to individuals without having the complications of being in private partnerships, which is really what hedge funds are. Well, and I also think, you know, individuals can't do that on their own. So if you yeah. look at your mortgage backed product, that sort of thing, which are always hard to trade anyway, uh, you know, having something like that makes a lot of difference. But I would I would really uh, tell everyone, look, go go to the site, see what's going on at Simplify. We we I've always had a great respect for the amount, the new things that you devise that nobody's ever thought of. Well, it's, uh, so, so to be fair, a lot of this stuff actually does exist in the institutional high net worth yeah. space. We've tried to bring that or devise access to it by bringing it in, um, but I agree with you. And I think we really spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time trying to share my thoughts and my perspectives. We as a firm spend an awful lot of time educating. And so I'm, I'm creating our website, www.simplify.com was not available. Um, and take a look at the product offerings as well as, and I, I really emphasize this, the educational component there. When, when I was saying not available, that's what I meant that for an individual investor, they didn't have a chance uh, because yeah. nothing was ever put out there that would work for them. But listen, Mike, uh, always enjoy your comments. We could talk to you for hours because you have so much information on all these different subjects and there's a lot more we could cover. But listen, I want to thank you very much for being with us and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year. I look forward to it. Thanks a lot, Ted. All right. Thanks, Mike. Hello everyone, I just want to say if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.